and it's my pleasure and privilege today to introduce Keith Richburg, a, a journalist whose work I've admired for more than 20 years, and as a journalist for 40 years, I can say I don't say that every day. I mean, Keith has had a fantastic career. Um, I asked him to send a copy of his bio today to prepare these introductory remarks, and um, I think it's easier actually to list the events you were not covered in, not covering Keith and the ones you were involved in, but I think you'll talk a bit about your career today, but a brief resume, uh, you began in Asia post-Marcos in the Philippines, Cambodia, you covered the civil war in Somalia, Rwandan genocide, Middle East, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, post 9-11 in America, campaign trail, though you didn't actually interview Donald Trump. <laughs> that's, one, that's one you've got to work on. Uh, and he wrote um, an amazing book about Africa, an American, out of America, out of America. A Black Man Confronts Africa, which was a very tough book and, and received a lot of attention. Awards, and um, more recently, Keith has taken over the mantle of running the Hong Kong University Journalism and Media Studies Center from Ying Chan. It's a tough act to follow. She created it, I think, 20 years ago now, Keith. So Keith is arriving back in Hong Kong, where he, 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 he was here also for the before and after the handover. He covered the handover at that time. He's also a former president of the FCC, so the CV is very long but he's now back running the Hong Kong University Journalism Program at a particularly interesting time in Hong Kong in, in press freedom. Uh, more, a few years back in 2009, he went back to Beijing where he'd already been bureau chief of the Washington Post. Sorry, his career was basically 30 years with the Washington Post. But in 2009, he really witnessed a sort of flourishing of the Weibo's, the internet, the online um, opening of discussion which subsequently, I think at the time, Keith, you actually thought it was like a sort of China spring, but you know, things have changed. So the topic of, your, of Keith's discussion, uh, talk this afternoon, will be why the digital revolution has not helped for press freedom, which seems like the opposite of what we expected, but I think it's a particularly um, pertinent topic. So looking forward to your talk, Keith. Thank you. Keith Richburg. Well, thanks, every much, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, please keep having your coffee and dessert and eating away if you're still eating. I see a few of you still nibbling away. I'll try to speak loudly so you can hear me over the rattling of China. I mean, that's dishes. <laughs> I used that joke in 97, and it worked too, actually. <laughs> but it, it is good to be back here at the FCC. I feel like I'm back among, uh, I feel like I'm back among old friends, uh, some of whom I still recognize, like Jim Gould here. Um, some who haven't changed a bit. Um, a few others have changed. A few of I think I don't think I've changed very much. Do you? Uh, you know, I, I bumped. I was in Thailand recently, and I bumped into an old friend, Kun Paisan, who was the editor of the Bangkok Post. And I looked at him and I said, Kun Paisan, you've gotten skinnier. And he said, Everything is relative. I've stayed the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's kind of my feeling when I walk into the FCC. And, uh, but you know, I used to, I'm, I'm very used to sitting on the dais here because I used to be president. So I used to do the job of introducing people here. And then I would usually get to sit down and finish my dessert and at the end of them, you know, hand them an FCC tie for having come and spoken. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't have a tie. So if you, if you still do the FCC tie routine, I can use a tie. So <laughs> thanks. So thanks very much. Uh, but, uh, I'll do a little biography, but really what I want to talk about today is, um, uh, you know, as the topic said, how the, in, uh, how the internet has not led to uh, what we thought it might lead to, which is more democratization, more press freedom, um, more openness. And in many ways, the, you know, how, basically I'm going to do something that journalists don't really like to do very much, um, so you're in for a treat. I'm going to tell you that I was wrong, and I'm going to tell you all the ways that I was wrong. Now, we, don't, we really don't like to admit mistakes very much. We like to kind of hide them in a correction box that comes out on page 15, but I'm gonna tell you all the ways that I was wrong from having covered, and I'm gonna try to just focus uh, on Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, and China, 
uh, which are the three places I think might be of most interest to the audience here as well. Um, so I'm going to tell you about how I was wrong, and I'm going to tell you kind of uh, basically how the internet and the digital revolution that we're now in the middle of really did lead to, it was, it was definitely disruptive, we all know that, and it's certainly been transformational in the way that we all lead our lives. Uh, but what I would argue that it has not altered the power relationship between people and governments uh, the way many, including myself, um, expected it would. And, uh, you know, but, and by the way, I would say it's not only me, I think I was in very good company. A lot of people actually anticipated that. But, you know, I, it, I say I'm coming back to Hong Kong because, you know, I first came here as a correspondent uh, to Southeast Asia in 1986, as Eric mentioned. I was first based in the Philippines, but that actually wasn't my first trip to Hong Kong. My first trip to Hong Kong was Christmas of 1983, uh, when I was a graduate student at the London School of Economics. Uh, and I did not actually realize that everything shut down over Christmas, and I had nowhere to go. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I went down to Chinatown in London, in Soho, and asked for the cheapest ticket they had. I was trying to get to Taiwan to see some friends of mine who lived in Taiwan. Uh, we were. We were student interns together in Washington, D.C., and my buddy Joel, who many of you may know, was an intern with the Agriculture Department going into the State Department. So he was in Taiwan learning Chinese, and I just thought I'd hop over to Taiwan and visit him over Christmas. Uh, he, uh, the easiest way to do that, he had told me in a letter, was just go to Hong Kong and then get a cheap flight over to Taiwan. Um, I did not realize that in 1983, Americans needed visas to go to Taiwan. So I ended up without a visa. So I had to come to in, and spend three or four days in Hong Kong waiting for the, the uh, Taiwanese consulate to open to give me a visa. And so I had no money. So I ended up walking around Kowloon and stayed in this YMCA next to the Peninsula Hotel, which was then quite cheap. I'm told it's actually not cheap anymore. So that was actually my first trip to Hong Kong. But 1986 to 1990 uh, was my time in the Philippines. And I did not get over to Hong Kong very much, but I did get here a couple of times. Specifically, I came in 1989 um, when things were going on in, across the border in the mainland. Uh, the Washington Post asked me to come here and see what the attitude and the mood would be in Hong Kong because, of, of course, we knew that the transition was coming. And also at the time, I was coming here uh, to cover the plight of Vietnamese refugees who were coming in in huge numbers um, in around 1988 and 89 into Hong Kong, and it was creating this huge crisis uh, for Hong Kong. So that was my first experience coming in here to Hong Kong. But the main thing I want to talk about from that period, 1985, 80, 86, 1986 to 1990, when I was based in Southeast Asia and really traveling around the region, was that I thought the people power movement of the Philippines was going to have ripple effects all across uh, Asia, East Asia. And we, you know, I thought basically that what happened at Tiananmen Square and what happened in Burma, as we then called Myanmar, I thought that was the aberration. Um, as, because as I looked around, I saw that in Taiwan, uh, Chang Cheng Guo uh, had basically opened up and allowed for democracy and free elections. Um, I was asked to go up to South Korea, where the students had taken to the streets in most South Korean cities in advance of the Olympics and demanded democracy. So there was the transition to mili from military rule to full democracy in South Korea. And I spent a lot of time in, the, in Indonesia um, during that period as well. And although it took another decade for things to change, I remember writing at the time that there was too much pent up frustration. Uh, the, the, the economic and political reforms had not kept pace with the, the growth of the middle class in, in the cities like Jakarta. And I remember writing back in those days that you know, this, Indonesia was also ripe for a people power-like explosion, but it, you know, who, knew, who knew how long it would take to happen. Uh, so fast forward a bit, and I came back again to Asia, this time based in Hong Kong in, in, in 1995. Uh, the Washington Post decided to open a foreign bureau that would cover Hong Kong for the transition and then Southeast Asia. So I would end up spending about 50% of my time in Hong Kong and then the other 50% of my time traveling around Southeast Asia. Now this was going to be an exciting time, I thought. I had just come from Africa. Um, in the interim period, the Soviet Union had collapsed, the Cold War was over, and, uh, and I thought that, and democracy was really taking a foothold uh, all over the continent. We saw Eastern Europe, for example, uh, transition from being communist-led into uh, to democratic. We saw uh, democracy taking a foothold in Latin America. Um, it was in fits and starts in Africa, so I thought I was going to be going back to Southeast Asia where I could follow up on that trend that I was following from my first period there, how the people power movement of the Philippines would kind of inspire and encourage other movements around. Uh, 
the, in Hong Kong specifically, you know, and, here's, and this is really interesting, I think, there was, there was a mood of real optimism, I think. Now, all of us were you know, a little bit skeptical. We were all writing pretty critical stories about what might happen, how the, uh, the, the government, the Chinese government coming in decided to abolish the last elected legislature, the LegCo, and, and replace it with an appointed LegCo. But overall, there was kind of this feeling of optimism, and there was a feeling that the new challenge ahead was going to be to hold China to its obligations under the basic law and under the one country, uh, the one country, two systems uh, policy, you know, and that, and that was a you know, and you you, you didn't really see any kind of a, you know radical element advocating anything like independence for Hong Kong. That was not even in the cards uh, back in those days. Uh, I should also say that 1997 uh, was a fascinating year, but it was not because of the handover for journalism. In fact, the handover was more interesting for what did not happen. Uh, what did not happen was any kind of mass panic. Uh, what did not happen was any kind of huge flight of people out of Hong Kong. And it was actually kind of a, a, a non-event in the sense of the journalistic sense. We were all waiting for something major to happen, dramatic. And we all woke up on July 1st and July 2nd, and things were kind of mu pretty much the same. But the big story of 1997 that we had no idea was coming was the Asian economic crisis. And to me, that ended up being the major story of 1997 for a variety of reasons, uh, and pr primarily because the Asian economic crisis, which led to a devaluation of the currencies and a loss of faith in governments across the region, it also led to this kind of upsurge in the kind of people power movements that I thought I was going to see earlier. Um, if you recall, uh, it led to huge street demonstrations in Jakarta that eventually, a year or two later, led to the fall of Suharto. Um, it led to the Reformasi movement in Indonesia. Uh, it led, in Thailand, it led to a huge outpouring of, of protest against the government of General Chavalit Yang Chayut, if you remember him. Uh, he was basically toppled, and uh, the people pushed for what became known as the People's Constitution. And they had a revolution in Thailand that led to this new democratic constitution that was going to institutionalize change in Thailand. So we were all kind of, and myself included, swept up in this idea that, wow, you know, the economic crisis is going to change now Southeast Asia on the political landscape as well. Um, there were new NGOs sprouting up. Uh, a lot of these countries were forced to go to the IMF for bailouts, and the bailouts were coming with conditions attached. And, uh, there's, and, and the other thing that was happening then, and this is key, which was new technology, this new digital technology was finally taking hold. And this was something that I saw was really going to empower people and change uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia uh, for good. I went back and, uh, in preparation for coming here and chatting with you, I actually went back and looked at one of the old stories I wrote at the end of 1997 when, the, when this uh, economic crisis was roiling and reformasi was going in Indonesia. And what I wrote at the time was, and I quote from myself, <laughs> Just as democracy has swept through Latin America and the former communist-run states of Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War, East Asia, too, is in the midst of what many are calling a slow but steady move towards more pluralism and openness. That's what I wrote at the end of 1997. And as I said, I, you know, I basically will now stand here and tell you that I was wrong. You know, and in many ways, uh, what I thought happened uh, has actually been reversed in a lot of countries if you look at Thailand today. Now, now e even though I'm admitting that I'm wrong, which I don't like to do, I'll say that I was in pretty good company. Uh, even, even then President Bill Clinton in 2000, shortly before leaving office, uh, famously said, you know, controlling the internet will be like trying to nail jello to the wall. Good luck with that. And uh, now I look back later and I say, you know, the jello is sticking pretty well to that wall. <laughs> Uh, you know, I did a lot of other things in between, as uh, Eric mentioned. Uh, you know, the, we had the 9/11 attacks. I was in the Middle East a lot. I was in Afghanistan. I was in, uh, you know, I was in, uh, in in Iraq for the war. Uh, I ended up back in New York as the as, as the New York bureau chief. But then, in the end, uh, late 2009, the Washington Post asked me to come back again uh, to fill in first to fill in for the bureau in Beijing, and then later on to just basically become the bureau chief. So I ended up staying for about three and a half years in China. 2009 was a fascinating year to come back to Asia and to come back to uh, China. Uh, the first thing that, uh, one of the first stories I found in 2009 was a very obscure little story. It was about a, 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 a young driver for a company. He drove a car, and his name was uh, Sun Zhongjie. 
And what had happened was he was in Shanghai and he got caught in a police entrapment uh, uh, campaign. They basically were looking for illegal taxis, people using their cars as illegal taxis. So what they would do would be they would set somebody up on the side of the road to hail down a car. And if someone picked up that passenger a few yards down the road, the police would stop them and then ticket that driver for being an illegal taxi. So this young guy was driving for a company. He saw someone waving him down on the side of the road who said his car was broken down. He decided to give this person a lift. A few, few yards down the road, he gets stopped and ticketed and told that he's uh, driving an illegal taxi. Now this young man protested this and he said, I wasn't doing an illegal taxi, I was just picking up someone who was stranded. I never asked for any money, but he couldn't get his money back. And he tried, he went to the courts and he could not get his money back. So in a rather defiant act of protest, he went outside the traffic court in Shanghai and with a, an ax, a meat cleaver, a, you know, a cooking cleaver, he chopped off his little finger. Now, this was a pretty dramatic thing. Now, had this happened in, in, when I used to go in the Chinese in the 90s, I went in and out of China quite a lot from Hong Kong. If this had happened before, I never would have heard about it. I heard about this instantly because it was all over blogs, it was all over Weibo, and it was everywhere. And I could see the picture of the guy being passed around on Weibo. And so I decided, I'm in Beijing, I decided to hop down to Shanghai with my news assistant to see what was going on. By the time we arrived at the traffic court, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of drivers, taxi drivers, others who had been ensnared in the same entrapment scheme, who had all gathered demanding their money back because they had all heard about this guy's act of protest through Weibo. And within a few days, the Shanghai government decided to reverse all of these fines and refund all of, all of the money that these people had paid. So I went away from that thinking that something is changing now in China because, first of all, the fact that I could sit in Beijing and hear about this, you know, you know, hundreds of miles away, and secondly, the government actually responded because of this outcry that was on this new thing called Weibo or social media. And so I was there in China between 2009 and 2013, and I decided that to then to concentrate on this new platform, Weibo, that to me was changing the way government dealt with people. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I covered a lot of stories during that period of time. I covered the story of the, of the blogger whose name was the, uh, in Chinese, it, turned, it translates into the Secretary General of the, uh, of the Fruit and Mountain. And basically what this guy did was he just went through official photographs that were appearing in Xinhua, et cetera, and he would zero in uh, on the official's wristwatches. And then he would, he would use a catalog to find out how much that wristwatch cost versus what the salary was of that government official. And some of these government officials ended up getting, trouble, getting in trouble with the disciplinary unit and losing their jobs. You had all of these kinds of bloggers and others who were like exposing official corruption, going outside the NPC, for example, the National People's Congress, and taking pictures of the handbags that some of the delegates were carrying, or the briefcases, and then finding online how much those handbags and briefcases really cost. So this was kind of a, a, a people's campaign against corruption going on in China that I actually thought was fascinating. So I won't say it was all uh, negative. In fact, during, I, could, and I considered that period the kind of the free and open Weibo period of China. And during that period, you had increased government accountability. The government actually paid attention to what people were complaining about on Weibo and then changing their viewpoint. And I can give you many, many examples of that. Just one small example. If you remember the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster in Japan, people on Weibo started complaining about the possibility that China's nuclear plants were being approved way too hastily and without proper safeguards. And so the prime minister then, Wen Jiabao, actually declared a short moratorium on new approvals for nuclear plants. And that was completely in response to popular pressure. So number one, increased government accountability. They were listening to what people were saying via Weibo. Number two, it gave citizens a way to speak to each other and to organize online around like-minded causes. Um, for example, I met another young guy in Shanghai who started a food safety blog where if you were in a, any, any place in China and you discovered that your, the food you were eating was contaminated or there was some kind of scandal in the local press, you could post it on that blog. And it's still going today. It's called Throw It Out the Window. And you could actually look online with a map of China and click on your area and see how many food safety scandals there were, or how, much, how much tainted beef there was, or fake pork, or this sort of thing. So that was the third thing. It allowed people to organize online around like-minded causes. Number three, uh, it gave citizens a way to speak out 
against, uh, uh, to, to, to power. It gave citizens the first time a voice to speak out against policies they did not like. And then the fourth thing it did was it allowed news to filter through to people uncensored. So if you found an interesting article anywhere in English or Chinese, you could paste it on your Weibo account and send it out and then it was free, everybody could read it. So those were you know, four ways that I thought China was changing and it was never gonna change back again. But I was wrong. What happened then came 2011, and I must admit, I didn't realize it at the time, but 2011, 2011 was a crucial year, because two things happened that year. Number one was the Arab Spring, and that really caused the government in Beijing to suddenly realize that the internet was a threat. And then the second thing that happened was in July of that year was the Wenzhou train crash. Uh, that was the high-speed train that crashed at Wenzhou. Um, I was there at the time, I was actually in Shanghai. I was actually traveling back from Zhejiang to Shanghai at the time, so I was there and I knew something was going on because I could see it out the window of the train. And nobody, this never appeared on official news for, for many, many minutes, up to an hour or more after the train crash, but I knew about it because people were going on Weibo and, and actually recording footage and sending pictures from inside the damaged train cars. So we, the foreign press, were able to report that there was a massive high-speed train crash, people were killed, there were people still trying to get out of the car before anything ever appeared, appeared in the official media. And so this really shook up, I think, the, uh, the regime in China and made them realize that this was getting out of control and they had to do something to get the internet under control. And so the Wenzhou train crash in the Arab Spring in 2011, I think I really marked down as a turning point when the government decided they had to get control of this new platform. So let me just say, you know, what I did not anticipate would be how, was how effective they would be at this. What they, were, what they were able to do was basically build the Great Firewall higher than it had ever been before. They were able to employ more people to go in and look at what was being reported. They were able to then use the internet as a way to find out what people were thinking. And I did not anticipate that they would be willing to go through the mass arrests and others that they did of bloggers um, especially prominent bloggers and people who were using Weibo, the so-called big Vs, uh, the prominent businessmen, sports celebrities, et cetera. And they locked, by locking up a few, they were able to intimidate uh, pretty much everybody else. And they were able to also basically occupy the heights, occupy this new space by government ministries, propaganda officials, uh, provincial ministries, uh, public security, opening their own Weibo accounts and getting their own message out sometimes, and sometimes employing uh, their own uh, uh, legions, sometimes called the Wu Mao party, you know that, the 50 cent party, basically paying people to, to flood the internet with their own commentaries or their own counter view of things. So they, they were able to actually use Weibo to get their own message out as a, as a tool of propaganda. Uh, I should say one other thing. Now, in, you know, I was, I was not paying a lot of attention to Hong Kong at the time, but I was coming in and out of here occasionally. In Hong Kong, what I had anticipated and what I had written in, at the end, in 1997 and further at, after the handover uh, was that, yes, there was going to be a huge change, but it was not going to be in the direction we had anticipated. What I said about Hong Kong at the time, and I went back and looked at my actual story that I wrote on the day of the handover, and what I wrote at the time was that it's not gonna be so much that China is gonna come in and change Hong Kong. It's gonna be that Hong Kong is gonna change China. That Hong Kong's openness, it's, 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 uh, it's open court system, it's free press is going to filter that direction across the border. China was changing and Hong Kong is gonna accelerate that change. And again, that's something I go back now and look back and say, well, that was one I just pretty much didn't get right. And then again, as I look back at Southeast Asia, you know, despite all the hopefulness that I saw at the time, and again, I saw it, you know, I, I think I've read that passage to you that I wrote in 1997. I go back and look now. Uh, there, have been, there has been some progress, obviously. Myanmar has made a transition uh, to democracy. But when I look back specifically to the press, because we're talking about journalism here primarily at the FCC, uh, you know, I don't see a free press in a lot of places. Uh, just to confirm what I was thinking, I just checked out the Freedom House Index, if you ever go to Freedom House's uh, website online, and Southeast Asia is a huge spot where press is basically not free, uh, with the exception where they list, um, 
they list Indonesia and they list Hong Kong as partially free. Uh, every other place is listed as basically not free or under government control. And Southeast Asia's ratings specifically are dragged down because of places like Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Brunei, Malaysia, uh, where the press is controlled. So, you know, I want to speak, I'm looking at my time here. I want to save a lot of time for questions here since we're almost up to uh, 20 minutes and I was told to save a lot of time for questions. But I will say that, you know, so despite the fact that I was wrong about you know, how China would be changed by the internet. I was wrong about how Hong Kong would end up changing China for the better, and it's turned out that China has been more interested in pushing the one country as opposed to the two systems aspect of the arrangement. And I was wrong about Southeast Asia. I would say, first of all, in self-defense, if it's possible to get on a soapbox and be in a self-defensive crouch at the same time, that I was in pretty good company. I think we were all basically uh, thinking along the same lines. but. I like to always end on an optimistic note because I do think I'm an optimist at heart. And so if you ask me if I see any grounds for optimism, I'd say yes, I do. I, see, I do see three grounds for optimism now being back in Hong Kong. Um, I've only been back since July. So uh, you know, this is just what I see as having lived here before and being coming in and out of here over the years and being back. But number one, I see Hong Kong as showing a level of political interest and engagement that I never saw before. And I know sometimes it takes the form of antics like not taking your oath correctly or mispronouncing China as China. But to me, it's you know, the election itself, the turnout, the, and the participation of young people in that election shows me that there is a level of engagement that belies this kind of myth that Hong Kongers only care about making money. They don't care about, young people only care about their grades. Uh, the fact that they were able to keep the Occupy movement going, the fact that these young people get elected, it shows to me that there is a level of interest and engagement that's important for Hong Kong going forward. So that's point one. Uh, point two, I'm somewhat optimistic because I see all of these new uh, websites and media platforms springing up, not only here in Hong Kong, but everywhere around the region. Uh, in Malaysia, you have Malaysia Kini, for example. Here in Hong Kong, you have the Six Tone, and you have the Hong Kong Free Press. So there are, there are, there are these new blogs and new websites and new media platforms. Um, a lot of them are struggling financially, and, and, and et cetera, but I think you know, they, they're, they're out there, they're doing a job, and they need to be supported. And then the third, uh, the third and final point of optimism that I see is, uh, is the students that I'm now teaching as, as I've switched hats from being a journalist to a professor at the, at the Hong Kong University, the, at the Journalism and Media Studies Center. I'm very excited to find so many people, some of whom are here, uh, being excited about journalism and being excited about going into journalism. Uh, and I'm even particularly excited about the number of students we get to study journalism coming in from mainland China. Uh, they come to study with us because they want to learn best journalism practices. They want to learn about objectivity. They want to learn about fairness and balance. A lot of them have actually worked in the media in China and they've chosen to come and study with us because they want to know the best practices. And they're, and I always say this, they are the ones who are going to be telling China's story over the next 20 years. It's no longer going to be people like me. Uh, it's going to be Chinese telling the story of China. And if I can do what I can to arm them with the best journalistic practices, the whole idea of fairness, objectivity, how you cover stories, how you dig deeply, then I really think that it would have been worth uh, switching my hat from the journalism side to the uh, teaching side. So I'm going to leave it there. I mean, this is the first time you've seen a journalist probably self-flagellate and admit to uh, huge errors in reporting over the years. Um, but I'll just leave it at that and then hopefully take your questions if you have any. OK, thank, thank you, you, Keith. Well, what I would be interested to know is um, what is the underlying or common um, factor that uh, drive um, the, the, the wrong prediction that you have? Um, I'm not asking for specific um, country-wise um, reason, but are there any uh, common um, reasons or mm -hmm. principles that underneath this? Yeah, that's a good this? question. Yeah, what, you know, what made us all make the wrong predictions? I mean, you know, I think that's a very good question, and it's, I'd have to think a little bit more about this over time, and maybe even somebody can write a thesis about it. But uh, in general, I would say that what's happened here in Asia is, doesn't fit any model that we've ever had before. You know, I studied political science you know, as an undergraduate at Michigan and also at the London School of Economics. And everything I studied told me that as people became more affluent, they would demand more of a stake in their political system and countries become more democratic. 
that's just the way it works. If you start buying property and you're able to you know, accumulate some wealth, then you don't want the government telling you as much how to spend that. Uh, that's kind of what happened in South Korea, for example. Uh, that kind of what happened in Taiwan. You know, so middle the growing middle class, according to political science theory, was what was supposed to you know, shift you know, countries around and make them become more democratic. China has kind of turned that on its head in many ways because as I went around China talking to people, it, the middle class and the people who were affluent in the cities actually wanted stability more than they wanted democracy. And I would say pretty much the same tr was true of Thailand. I was amazed when I went around Bangkok at how many people who were friends of mine who were actually calling for a military coup because they thought, boy, this is crazy. These red shirts and these people from the rural countryside are coming in and they want to, they actually want their vote to count for the same as the votes of people in Bangkok, and but they outvote us. And you know, and, and the idea that one man, one vote, well, wait a minute. Well, the poor people in the rural areas in the northeast of Thailand actually outnumber the people in Bangkok. So one man, one vote would turn that on its head. So the whole idea that a growing middle class would not necessarily want more freedom and more pluralism that's completely against everything I had studied in political science. So I guess that might be one reason why I didn't anticipate it. And again, like I said about the internet specifically, I don't think any of us realize that, that, the, they, that the governments, and it's not just Asia, I was focusing on Asia, but you could look at Egypt, you could look at a lot of places around the world. I didn't realize that the, the, the structures of repression and censorship would grow to accommodate the changes in the internet. Uh, when I was in China from 2009 until 2013, I was amazed at how the netizens and the internet was able to constantly shift and change to evade the censors. But at some point, you know, they could even coming up with terminology, you know, words they could use in Chinese that the censors couldn't figure out what they were talking about. But at some point, you know, the, 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 the people in charge of censorship figured it out and got a lot better at censoring. So I, that was something I didn't realize. Uh, coming on to this theme of censorship in China and the internet, do you think the one reason why the internet in China has gotten less liberal is because the Chinese government has employed huge armies of um, people loyal to the party, the nickname is Wu Mao, mm -hmm. who post very, very pro-Chinese Communist Party propaganda on Weibo, social media, internet, and flame and attack those who criticize the Chinese government, a bit like the many supporters at the Trump rallies, you know? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I think that's absolutely one one of the factors. The Wu Mao, the Wu Mao party is huge. Uh, I guess you know one of the things that I'm always I always have to remind myself about in China is they have a huge population and they can employ a lot of people to insecurity, <laughs> for example. You know because I'm always constantly thinking. You know I was in China as a journalist and uh, you know we always thought that we were being monitored or bugged that they were listening to our calls, but my, my one solace was, well, they couldn't possibly have enough people to listen to all the phone conversations. That I have to, well, yes, they do have enough people <laughs> to listen to all the phone conversations. They have plenty of people. Uh, they can employ plenty of people in the security apparatus. So yes, so the Wu Mao party, that was actually one. I think the, and I do think the, the willingness to show a tough hand, to actually arrest people and jail people uh, for what they were writing online and blogging, uh, which I never anticipated they would do, uh, that also, and you only have to arrest and jail a few people, the big Vs, to scare everybody else. I, they have a, a saying about that, you know, you scare, what is it, scare a monkey to catch the flies or whatever. <laughs> so, you could, so you actually only have to jail a few people to get everybody realizing what's going on. And so absolutely, so now actually, you see Weibo is crushed. It's a shell of what it used to be, and people have gravitated towards WeChat, which is a closed system, so you only are talking among your friends. I think Florón said it's kill the chicken to scare That's the monkeys. It. Quit kill the chicken. I got my animals wrong. Kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. Okay. In terms of, you've spoken about government control. I want to ask you about business control and the way in which business um, sometimes takes a very insipid approach to this. We've seen Yahoo, for example, roll over a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Previously, as a broadcast journalist, I walked into the offices of Astro in Malaysia and watched stories from my own news service disappear before my very eyes, before being rebroadcast mm -hmm. on a short delay. And I wonder if you can speak to that component because we're also seeing Chinese companies take over media in other places. We've seen it happen here in Hong Kong. I, I wonder if you would talk to that point. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of aspects to untangle in that, but specifically, you know, businesses know that the China market is huge and they want to get into that China market and they're willing to do things that they, we probably would find offensive, cutting, you know, cutting things out, self-censoring. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested now in seeing how Facebook is desperate to get into China because they're seeing the potential for a billion new Facebook customers. But what agreements are they going to make up, uh, to make with China? Google tried this for a while and eventually they just basically gave up. But I see Facebook now desperate to get into China. And so I see a lot of companies. Uh, Hollywood is desperate to get into China because basically, you know, they're, they're opening more new screens in China every day than in the rest of the world combined. And so, you know, they're, and so Hollywood needs to sell its movies in China to be able to make profits. And so they're doing things like changing scripts or changing parts of scripts that might offend China or writing scripts to give a favorable part to China so that they can actually get their movies approved by the censors into China or just getting a little bit of Chinese money and then hiring a few Chinese actors here and there so you could call it a co-production so it doesn't fall under the censorship regulation. So I think there's a lot of bending over backwards now because people are still enamored of the massive market that is China and some are willing to cut some corners. And I would probably say that all the journalists who are based there too, uh, if they're into a company that has some financial dealings with China, you know, they, they probably are under you know, competing pressures um, where it's somehow outside, the business side wants to get in there and sell their products in China, where the news side is trying to cover things in a tough way. And I think everybody has, has those pressures they're trying to deal with. So it's, it's, it's incredibly tough. As you said, China is actually buying up media properties or they're, they're moving into media properties, not just in Hong Kong, but everywhere. And, and that's, that's just a, an example of how they're trying to ex extend Chinese soft power um, around the world as well. They'd love to buy a Hollywood studio um, although you know they're, they're, they've spent a, China has spent an enormous amount of money in the United States with a, a China Daily version there and CCTV et cetera et cetera, I don't see it kind of changing hearts and minds uh, or switching people to the Chinese viewpoint on things because you know ultimately it's, the government's still judged by what the government does, not by kind of the propaganda it puts out. Um, if I were if I were advising CCTV or one of these outfits that's trying to open up in you know they have already opened up in New York or Washington and elsewhere, I would say just present a balanced news channel, and then people might actually watch it. But if it's kind of pro-China propaganda, then it's going to go the way of Al Jazeera America, which basically just closed down. But no, I think that's a huge issue of China trying to extend its reach and and use soft power around the world through its business acquisitions. I suspect you've been doing too much self-flagellating by <laughs> your reference largely to China. I mean, if I look around the region, actually, I see quite a lot of a rather different, a rather different picture. And if you look at Malaysia, actually, uh, the the blogs and so on, and Malaysia Kini and the Sarawak Report and this and that and the other, and the Malaysian Insider have done a lot uh, to reveal what has been going on, uh, while the, the, the newspapers. And TV obviously remain as, uh, uh, as under the government thumb as they ever were. Uh, Indonesia, again, I mean, uh, uh, quite lively media on plumbing and off plumbing. Uh, Philippines, certainly no worse than it was. <laughs> uh, even Vietnam, you see, uh, you know, there are some things seeping through uh, which wouldn't get through. And, print or television. In Thailand now, I mean, really, it's the only access people have is those who know how to avoid the, the uh, restrictions there. So I mean, if I look around uh, India too, I mean, in India, you see that uh, blogs of various sorts have actually undermined the position of the old sort of uh, media owned by the, the big tycoons. Mm -hmm. So. Um, too much self-flagellating? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I think we're in agreement here. I mean, I think I, I tried to say at the end, one of the points, my second point of optimism, in addition to our, our great students we have, <laughs> uh, the other point of optimism I had was that uh, I see these new media platforms that are growing and prospering. A lot of them are suffering financially or they need, they need our support. I mean, our support in terms of reading them and, and, and financial support. But I mentioned Malaysia Kini as one of those. 
Um, here, you know, you've got six tone, you've got some in Jakarta, you've got some that are trying in, uh, in, uh, in Thailand as well. So no, I do think the online sites are providing a new platform that's against, you know, that it's giving new and fresh media content that the government controlled media is not giving. I think those are great. I, I would probably disagree a little bit on Vietnam because I'm every time, for every site I see that's doing something brave, I see bloggers and people getting arrested and jailed. You know, so I think Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos are all three, and Brunei to some degree, are all kind of a black hole, you know, of, of, for media there. You, can, you, you put things out on these new blogs at your own risk. Um, Malaysia, I mean, they, they've stopped the cartoonist, uh, Zunar, from leaving the country, and he's under threat. And so I think Malaysia is kind of in a tricky area there. Singapore, which you know well, Philip, I think that's a tricky one. They also still charge you know, bloggers, a lot of these countries can use defamation laws uh, to go after people who are printing things online. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a pretty mixed picture, but I do think that that is one area to be optimistic about is this new media platform that, that's giving people a chance to put news stories out there that people might not otherwise see, but they're doing it at great risk. When you were in Beijing last time round, there was the 10 year transition of, towards the new leadership. Did anybody see a strong man like Xi Jinping coming? And if so, why? And if not, why? Because clearly it does seem to have had a bearing on what has since happened both in China mainland and in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely great question. And I gotta say that I, I can flagellate myself one more time <laughs> over that one because that was another one I got wrong. Um, I remember writing, I was there during the lead up to the uh, 18th Party Congress and writing how everybody was anticipating that Xi Jinping was going to be a breath of fresh air. He was seen as the guy who was more worldly. He was seen, you know, he had lived in Iowa for a while as a exchange, exchange pro, on an exchange program in agriculture or something. He was seen as somebody who was gonna just be, be, more, be more confident and he was probably more savvy about the internet, et cetera. And uh, boy, we couldn't wait to get rid of the stodgy old Hu Jintao days. And well, boy, wait till Xi Jinping comes in. And don't forget, people also were saying that Li Keqiang, the prime minister, was, uh, you know, he was kind of friendly with some people who were involved in the 1989 protests. So we were all anticipating there might be a reversal of verdicts on 1989. And so, in the two years leading up to the 18th Party Congress at the end of 2012, we all thought, wow, it's gonna be terrific once Xi Jinping takes over. Now people are looking back to the Hu Jintao days as the period of great openness and democracy in China, which I never thought that would actually absolutely happen at all. And so, yeah, so I, you know, it, I will self-flagellate again. I got that one completely wrong um, because I, and mainly because you know, we don't know what's going on. We just listen to people and so talking to the the usual suspects, the sources I would talk to and others would talk to in Beijing, there was this hopeful atmosphere uh, leading up to the 18th Party Congress and that this new leadership team that would come in would bring in something different. I think that was actually changed once we saw the lineup of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, which was stacked not with young reformers like Wang Yang from Guangdong, but was stacked with people, you know, the older uh, hardliners, as we would call them. And so we were, we, we were we were led to believe then that Xi Jinping took over, but he was forced to take in a lot of hardliners around them. That's why this plenum that's going on now is absolutely fascinating, because we'll be able to see um, when he's able to replace about five, as many as five of these uh, standing committee members, will he be able to put in his own folks, and which direction will that show us which way China is going? Is he gonna put in reformers who are gonna do things like break up state-owned enterprises, or will he continue to surround himself with hardliners? But that, I think that's absolutely right. I got that one wrong as well. So you're forcing me to, to into a fourth flagellation. So thank you very much, sir. Um, we get things wrong because we listen to what Twitter handles and their snappy one-liners instead of asking the farmers in the field or the mid-level bureaucrats that we used to do. And is it, is, it, is it a problem that it's not so much that you know, they're giving us the wrong answers. We're asking the, the wrong people the wrong questions. And what can we do to realign the, 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 the digital narrative with political and economic realities. What can we do as journalists to make sure we stop getting things wrong? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. I would, and I would answer yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think one reason we're getting it wrong is absolutely as you said, because you know, we're all reading what's, what's coming out on Weibo back from 2009 till 2013. Let's lose, use that as a, as a window. 
And so by reading everything on Weibo, I'm thinking to myself, sitting in Beijing and sitting in Shanghai, wow, everybody in China is you know, excised over this issue going on here. And what I did not, I knew intellectually, but I guess did not fully appreciate or let work into my reporting was that Weibo was giving me a, a narrow window on urban, younger, educated elite in China. And those don't necessarily represent everyone in China. I mean, I, and I, I probably spent way too much time in Beijing talking to people who were like my, my Chinese teacher, you know, who was 26 years old and getting everything off her mobile phone. I would ask her opinion about things and say, wow, she's really smart and she really is clued in and knows what's going on. China is changing, as opposed to spending as much time as I should have in uh, places like uh, Anhui or Wuhan. And so I, in answer to your question of what we should be doing, it would be probably putting down devices and doing what we used to always do, which produced really good journalism back in the old days before I had a device, which was get out in the fields, get on planes, get in cars, go out to rural areas, talk to farmers, talk to a real cross section of people, and don't fall into the trap as we all do, tend, as we all as journalists tend to do, of talking to people who are like us. Um, and, and this is not just China, but everywhere, including Thailand, et cetera. We love, we love to talk to the English-speaking, educated, urban elite, you know, with degrees from universities in America and, and, and England, um, because they speak the same language we do. And I think often that gives us a skewed perspective on everything. And I think even in Thailand, if people had spent more time up in the Northeast talking to farmers and less time talking to the urban elite in Bangkok, they might have anticipated the, uh, uh, the, the pro-toxin sentiment and the schism going on. But no, I think you're absolutely right. So the answer, if my journalism students are here, get out, report, get out in the fields, get your feet dirty, get out, you know, walk through the rice fields, you know, talk to real people. Don't rely on the devices as much and realize that not everybody's connected. Okay, one last question over here. Uh, maybe since we're talking about media and the internet, uh, WikiLeaks, uh, you know, I mean, do you think WikiLeaks, I mean, like that in Asia would have a major impact? Do you think that makes traditional news outlet redundant of our posts or outdated, or what kind of role do you expect them to play? Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, with WikiLeaks, I think, you know, we, I think as, as journalists, we need to treat them as we would treat any other source, just as a source of information. But I think you still need the journalist to look at the documents and put it in the context and collate it. Because what WikiLeaks does is just kind of dump things on you. But I do think there's still a need for traditional uh, media. Uh, one of the things that I think was kind of exciting is the consortium of journalists that came out with the Panama Papers. That's what I think the things are heading is where you get consortium of journalists working in different countries all using the same data together. But with the kind of WikiLeaks model or its Snowden model where you're just dumping data out there without anyone kind of looking through it and collating it and finding the real stories in there, I don't think, most people I think don't have the time or the inclination or the energy to read through a data dump of documents and figure out what in here is important or what's not. But with something like the Panama Papers where you had the data, the data dump of documents, but then professional journalists in different countries who actually did the reporting, put the, you know, connected the arrows, connected the dots, and then presented it in terms of coherent stories. I think that's a model for the future, specifically as uh, media organizations don't have as much money to do this kind of international reporting themselves, so they can rely more on these sort of consortium arrangements. So I think that's the more of a model than the WikiLeaks data dump style. I mean, just to finish up, Keith, it was just a question I wanted to ask you was in the, what do you say to your students? I mean, we're in the social media world, and also social media has become a bit of an echo chamber. People on Facebook get news from the people that think the same way as themselves. The, I think the American election with Trump has shown we're in a post-factual world also. <laughs> so how do you explain, what's your message to your students when they ask, is, is journalism or, and are journalists still relevant? Yeah, it's a great question, and I'm sure one of them will ask. Uh, <laughs> yeah, journalism is still relevant, as I say that, you know, the, and I say, if, I say several things. Number one, I say that lack of time is the enemy of good journalism. This whole idea that we have to get things out fast, we have to tweet it the minute we know it, we have to write it on a blog the minute we know it without actually taking the time to verify, to fact check, that's, one of the, that's number one, the enemy of good journalism. 
and secondly, I'm saying, you know, the, the, the whole idea of journalistic objectivity is being turned on its head. Um, I think we can still try to be for fairness, but we need to actually fact check in real time. Uh, specifically, and I've used some examples in my uh, lectures I do to students about how journalists in the U.S. now are starting to actually call out uh, Donald Trump, among others, if he says something in real time that is not true. Because it's no longer just, well, he said this and then she said that. I mean, there are some things that are provable facts. If somebody says, I never said such and such, and you can actually go back and find a tape of him saying it, you need to say in the story at the time that this is not true, this contradicts what he said. I don't, need, I don't think you need to go as far as the New York Times did once in one headline or story where they actually used the word lie, uh, just because the word lie carries a huge uh, negative connotation to it, but you can point out that if someone is saying something that's factually, provably incorrect, and I think we need to do a better job of that because journalistic objectivity becomes something that we hide behind and it ends up becoming a he said, she said sort of thing. Uh, and, and you could get into a lot of debates on this, but I mean, for example, even on things like climate change, if 90% of scientists or 95% of scientists are telling us that the world is getting warmer and you've got 5% saying it's not, do you really need to say he said, she said on that one? I don't think so. I think you need to just present it as fact that the world is getting warmer. The, you know, the, the countries of the world are signing a ch climate change agreement. You might mention in the story that there's still a holdout of a tiny percentage of scientists, but I don't think you need to go for the old journalistic balance of he said, she said, because I think people really want the truth. Uh, they don't just want uh, this kind of veneer of objectivity for its own sake. Okay, thank you, and with that. Um, thank you, everybody, and it's really good to be back at the FCC. And you get a tie. Do I get a tie? <laughs> uh, it's too hot to put it on. Though. <laughs>